last month, I reviewed the 2019 adaptation of the several of the Boogie Pop no novels with uh, the Boogie Pop and Others television series, bringing those stories to the screen more or less for the first time, with maybe the exception of the first novel in the live-action movie. This time, however, I'm going to be taking a look at the earlier Boogie Pop anime, Boogie Pop Phantom, which came out way back in 2000, which means it's old enough to drink. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Anyway, on with the review. Boogie Pop Phantom was an anime that came out in 2000 that very much served as a counterpoint to Serial Experiments Lane in the eyes of American anime fans of the time. Both works are dark psychological suspense series containing conspiracies and supernatural elements. Both are heavy on suspense and depict their high school age protagonists dealing with a heavy weight of intense personal dread, psychological pressure, and often with that trauma based on the burdens of society and how they play on them and their peers based on the obligations that are put upon them by adults, both in terms of parental figures and in terms of um, their uh, teachers and so forth at school and bullying and so forth in school as well. However, one work draws directly from an existing franchise, the very long running series of boogie pop novels that had already at that time become a part of the Japanese cultural zeitgeist, inspire, inspiring numerous imitators, um, both in the context of light novels, but also in terms of anime and manga as well. Arguably the predecessor to Shiki from uh, Tsukihime, the similarly named character from uh, the Garden of Sinners light novels, draws some parallels from uh, Boogie Pop and uh, Toka. So consequently, because of that level of cultural permutation, the sh creators of the show can make assumptions about how much knowledge of the series the audience would have going in, especially since it wears the connection with the earlier works on its sleeve with its title. Whereas Lane, because it didn't have that additional foreknowledge that was required or expected by the creators, ended up striking a stronger chord with American audiences, and Boogie Top was viewed more impenetrable and inscrutable when it first came out in the United States. Now, it bears mentioning that because of how widespread American cultural um, per cultural stuff permeates across the world, this is something that in the U.S. we don't run into that often. Probably the best example that immediately comes to mind is like the popularity of television series like Captain Scarlet and the Mysterians and other uh, similar Gary Anderson works or even stuff like Biggles. And the novels that inspire, and the novels in that series in the UK, and how those would inspire subsequent films and comics that would completely fail to get over in the United States because of that earlier lack of familiarity. However, now we're in 2022. The novels have received translated US releases, and if you were watching the channel last month, um, several of them were adapted to a 2019 anime that received a US release that I review that the review of that came up last month. Go watch it. So the question then becomes, how does this this earlier show hold up when you have now have the knowledge to punch through the surface that people in 2020 or, or in a 2000 rather did not have? To semi-synopsize, if I was to give Boogie Pop Phantom a punny subtitle, it would be Echoes of Manticore. By way of explanation, the events of Boogie Pop Phantom play very heavily with the aftermath of several of the novels, particularly the first novel, Boogie Pop Doesn't Fi Smile, the fourth novel, Boogie Pop at Dawn, with a hint of Boogie Pop vs. Imaginator thrown in for good measure. Some of the events of those novels are referenced and even flashed back to you directly, while others have their own spin given on them. Following a giant pillar of light, which is implied to be the conclusion of Boogie Pop Doesn't Smile, blasting into the sky over the town where the Boogie Pop novels are set, Various people in town start developing supernatural abilities of various stripes. Additionally, a being with abilities similar to Manticore also returns, as does another person who has Echo's speech patterns, 
combined with that person also having the ability to bring up past and sometimes future memories from people. And then on top of all of that, it, there's a false Boogie Pop floating around, calling themselves the Boogie Pop Phantom. The narrative of the show is done in a very non-linear fashion, with frequent flashbacks not only to the events of uh, the novels, but also like moving back and forth in characters' personal timelines, with one episode being set before the events of a separate ep of a of a earlier episode in terms of air dates, that sort of thing. In for example, the entirety of the first episode is basically a flashback of characters having while they're washing their hands. The shifts in the timeline aren't communicated well as well as similar shifts in, say, for example, Bacano, but they are evident if you're paying attention. This is Definitely not to have something to put on in the background while you're um, doing dishes or something like that. It also bears mentioning that a lot of the clues the show lays down are ones that are only particularly transparent to people who have familiarity with the books or consequently have seen the later shows. For example, um, the Phantom's appearance doesn't look quite right compared to the art both on the books and in the earlier television, in the earlier or the later television series of uh, Boogie Pop and others, and additionally, while there's a whistling whenever the Phantom shows up, implying that it's based off common knowledge, so to speak, of or the urban legends of Boogie Pop, it's just a single tuneless note as opposed to what what happens when actual Boogie Pop shows up, where the whistling of the introduction of Thy Meister Singer von Nuremberg, which is one of the character's defining character traits. So it's, it's a nice clue there, and again, something that you'll pick up if you've watched the, the 2019 series or read the novel somewhat, but otherwise it can certainly, again, seem a bit more impenetrable unless you go back through on multiple viewings. Where I think the series fumbles is one particular element of the visuals. Like Lane, the series uses a deliberately muted color palette. However, the palette is accented by a filter put over the view with the intent of making it look like there's like very heavy film grain or light static, um, giving everything an additionally dark tone to it. With Lane, the series had muted colors, but also very harsh contrasts between light and dark, with particular uses of spot color to emphasize things in the frame to draw the viewer's eye, with harsh glare, to, um, like very bright light glare to make things seem more intimidating, um, and certain environments seem more hostile. Whereas here, everything, it's just dark and muddled. Even with characters who are meant to visually stand out from the environment, like the character of Poom Poom. Um, or when characters are, going, are out of their regular city going to Tokyo in the final episode, the dark visual tone persists. I understand why they're doing it. They're, it's to provide a general sense of oppression and dread, a visual representation of the pressures personal, societal, and familial that the characters are facing, but the execution of it does not work as well as I think they hoped, um, considering, again, animation is a visual medium, and the presentation in this way just makes the characters look blah, um, makes it hard to tell details at various points of the show, not because the it feels like the animators or the directors are trying to deliberately withhold that information, but just because they had a really good idea, but then took it way too far. I am really glad I watched this show, and honestly, watching it on Blu-ray made the visuals much more clear than I'd imagine they would have been if I'd watched them on DVD or VHS back in the day. I give this a definite recommendation if you've watched the 2019 series or read the novels. But otherwise, honestly, I would recommend going through those ad adaptations or translations of the previous, as of when the show aired, but not the U.S., in the U.S. release, 
works in the series first. Certainly some old school anime fans who watched the show before reading the novels and loved it um, will argue that watching the work without the context is the more true experience. And I would say, sure, but I'd also, but also it's an experience that's only true to North American anime fans in particular age. And it's certainly not true to the work, to the creator of the work's original intent, nor would it be true to the audience of the series when it originally aired. Those re um, people watching it when it came out would have absolutely had the option to go to a book off or any other bookstore and just buy a copy of the book of, of the books if they were missing out on anything. Never mind looking stuff up on the internet. So insisting on a degree of absence of no, of available knowledge going into it with a with a knowledge vacuum um of that type is feels excessive i mean if you want to go in blind that's absolutely your thing more power to you it's totally your prerogative but there's nothing wrong with reading the books or watching the more recent series first. In fact, certainly, again, if you watch the more recent series while it aired, um, going back to this earlier one probably puts you in the best possible pos position to get the most out of it. Think About Phantom is currently available on physical media from Right Stuff and Amazon, and there are links to where you can get it in the doobly-doo, and buying anything through those links helps support the show. It's also currently available for streaming on Crunchyroll if you prefer to watch it that way. And there'll be a link to that as well. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 